get a groomer who will come to the house, Mm -hmm. bathe your own dog, do some training online in your house, like just give the dog a break from it. These are the things you can do. And then at the end of the day, if it's a really big problem, you just have to modify your life a bit before you solve this. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dog Sense. I am your host, Kathy Santo, and I am here with just Sarah. <laughs> hey, Sarah. Sorry, guys. Just me today. We don't get all the New Jersey trainers. I am all alone. I'm still sitting on the bench that I put together yeah, yeah. because I had like four people on this bench. Ooh, it's kind of quiet. It's OK, though. I like it. We're good. All right. What are we talking about today? All right. So today we're going to talk about car phobias, right? So what we mean by this is a dog who is either terrified to get into the car, they're, they're, they're not able to jump into the car, could also be that they tend to display some behaviors while they're in the car that would make you think that they might be afraid of it as well. Could be a variety of things, could be excessive drooling, could be barking, could be shaking, could be vomiting. There's a ton of different things that go into issues that dogs may have in the car. So we'll start out with, okay, Let's say someone has a dog and they can't get them to jump in the car and it's too big of a breed for them to pick it up and put it in the car every single time. What are some of your first things to get started with? Well, my first question always is, has your dog ever had a bad experience in the car? And I think that is key, right? Before we solve anything, I want to know what the history on this dog is. And you would be surprised. I remember when I was 17, I was first dating my husband. He was telling me how his dog hated the car. Like she'd get sick. And and I was like, oh my gosh, that's so strange. He goes, yeah, not really. We took her to a car wash one time. And after that, she was never the same. (laughs) Okay, as your trainer, and I wasn't then, (laughs) as a trainer now, I want to know, did you, you would be surprised there. Well, you wouldn't because it happens to you do. People like, yeah, we got rear-ended. Does that count? Yeah, Yeah, it does. All right. So let's just say your dog had a bad experience in the car. Your journey to this is way longer. You either need to get another car. (laughs) (laughs) Or get one that looks different. Right. Or train the dog into a different car. I'm serious because the dog has that feeling about that. car. You would too. You're in mind your own business and all of a sudden something out of the blue happens. So a lot of people after an accident, they have a really hard time getting back in their cars because it's that fear thing. So you have to kind of emphasize with the dog and understand they're not doing it to be difficult. They're genuinely terrified to get back in that darn car. And it could be you're driving too. Like (laughs) my mother used to drive like that. It was terrible. Uh, So anyway, let's talk about getting your dog in the car. The biggest people mistake people make is that they try to get their dog to jump on the seat. Right. Yep. They should aim for the floor. Yep. Put high value treat. And I don't mean like a treat treat. I mean, I'm talking people food, man. Like the good stuff. Put it on the floor of the car, have them eat it, and then do that a couple of times and you're done. Notice I didn't say have them eat the treat, shove them in the car, get in the car and drive (laughs) for five hours. Like let's take this incrementally bit by bit. So your dog successfully can get in the car. I would also say people should move the passenger or the driver's seat forward. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's great. People come and they're like, my dog won't get in the car. And I go to their car and I move the seat forward and I put chicken on the floor. The dog hops in. They're like, you're kidding me right now. (laughs) But sometimes it's as easy as that. So those are really good things. Move the seat up, high value treat, get in, eat and leave. No big, long times in the car with that. Now we have to mention this just because we're trainers. Now for us, the safest place for your dog to be riding in a car is in a crate. Crash tested, most likely. If that's not an option, your car is not big enough for a crate or your dog's too big for a crate, next up would be a crash tested seatbelt. So some kind of harness that is designed to be tested against crashes so that when your dog, if God forbid you got in an accident, your dog doesn't become a projectile and then go slamming into the front windshield, a side window or anything like that. So the next step of this would be, I need to get my dog. So now my dog will jump into the bottom part of the car, right? So now I need to decide long-term, how is my dog traveling? So then I would say, all right, we either need to get used to him now jumping from the floor of the car to the bench seat, now into the crate, right? Or I have to get them used to wearing this harness, jumping in the car with the harness on, because that's another piece of it as well then clipping it in and then having them come out again. But my next step to this would be, okay, so now I need to practice how are they going to be traveling, crate or harness, um, and get them used to that picture. 
Now, if you're doing a crate, awesome. We love that. Make sure it's secured. Yeah. Because an unsecured <laughs> crate yep. in a wreck then becomes a flying through the air projectile yep. and it's going to be a problem. Additionally, Sarah, sometimes we get dogs who are afraid to get in the car. And anytime I have a dog who or a client with a dog with a long coat, mm-hmm. I will get a dryer sheet and rub down the dog's yeah. body. And really because a lot thing. of times there's static electricity, right? So they yep. jump in the car, they get that static snap and they're like, oh, that really sucked. Yep. And that's why they have those static strips. You've seen them on the back of trucks or, yeah. or even cars, right? So it, it, I don't know, it grounds it, right? It gets that static off of the car. And so to me, that is a super ninja trick to see mm-hmm. if maybe that is the reason your dog didn't want to go in the car in the first place. Yep. A couple of things with getting in the car before we move into now the process of turning on the car, you can add some kind of step, right? So if you're, if you have to hop into, if your dog hops into the trunk, that's not necessarily an option for us to do that little, the stepping onto the floor of the car first. So you could have a step, maybe it's a turned over laundry basket. Maybe it's like a cinder block or something, right? Uh, We use climb platforms a lot of the times if you have one of those, Um, but use some kind of step so that's not just the straight launch into the back of your SUV. It's a much gradual thing for them to then get used to. This is another piece of helping them figure out the way up. Because make sure they're familiar with that step before you put it by the car. Right. Like, let's have them get used to it in the house and in the yard, and then you can attach it to the thing you're trying to do. Because a lot of times with these dogs, it's not that they can't jump in the back of the car. I worked with, he's an 80 pound lab and his owner is elderly, right? She could not get this dog to jump in the back of the car. Not for hot dogs, love or money, right? He was not jumping in the back of that car. Once we added in the step, And we um, trained him with confidence building exercises, right? Getting him more comfortable and confident in his own body to launch himself into that car. Then he was able to do it. So sometimes it's a mental block in terms of building up the dog's confidence. Physically, we know that they can do it. They don't know that, right? So having that step there can help build their confidence in themselves and in their body to be able to make that jump. And momentum. People (laughs) stop trying to get your dog to jump from a standing position two inches from the car. Like, yep. I just, you back up six feet and start running. Yep. The dog likely will take that momentum. And it's also mm-hmm. about how do you feel about it? If you're like, oh my God, yeah. he's not going to do it. Okay, then you're going to guarantee he's not going to do it. And if you're exactly. not confident, you move towards the car, like, come on, baby, mm-hmm. right? The dog is going to say, oh, you know what? She's nervous too. I'm not going to jump up there. Yep. Don't put your dog on a long leash and give them like six feet to juke around it, but right. don't put them on a tight leash. Cause if you're stringing them up tight, they can't jump either. Yep. I would, you know what I would do, Sarah? I would video myself. If I was having yeah. trouble getting my dog in the car, I would set the phone up and record it. And then I'd watch it in playback. And it would be like, we were watching it. And you'd, you're gonna say, oh, wow, no wonder. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Boy, I'm really messing this up. And then you can fix it. It's, it's not really that hard. You just have to sort of think outside the box. All right. So now we're in the car. Awesome. We're jumping up. We're in a seatbelt. We're in a crate. We're in something. We're in the car. Now we have to figure out for this. Now this is for the dogs who get stressed on the ride. We have to figure out what part of the ride is stressing them out. So normally the first thing is get the car, get the dog in the car, turn the car on for five minutes, see what your dog does. Does he immediately start barking at the sound of the car starting to turn on? Does he immediately start circling and pacing and getting anxious and nervous? Does he start drooling, right? So those are all some of the body language cues that you're looking for when you first turn the car on to see what is it. We have to play detective here, figure out what's freaking you out. And sometimes we turn the car into like the meal zone. So the car is in the garage, you're not turned on. You go in, you sit in the back seat, you feed your dog, you play tug with them. If you have a tiny dog, you play ball in the back seat mm-hmm. with them, right? right? But it becomes a good thing. Mm-hmm. And if you have the time between now and when you need to take your dog in the car next, you know, this is an option. You will, yeah. it's called counter conditioning, but it is slow. It's damn slow. It's really hard to do for a dog who's super upset. And then when you get into that category, Sarah, then we're thinking, all right, can we do something with the pheromones, Right. Right. Can we do the plug in the car pheromone? Can we do a diffuser? Can mm-hmm. we do it? What is it? A daptyl? I've not had great results with it across the board, but I have had students who do. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going on a car ride and you're like, I got to go yep. talk to your vet because they have, uh, I can't remember the name of the drug, but 
it does help the dog relax and not feel nauseous. But I think this is like the nail grinding question. A dog right. is terrified of getting his nails done. So you don't have the luxury to desensitize before you do the next nail cutting. The dog right. needs their nails cut. So at some point, maybe they're in the crate and you have to cover it with a sheet so they're not seeing things go by. Maybe you yeah. have to do it adaptal. Maybe you have to talk to your vet about something to chill the dog out. But, you know, at some point you're gonna do all the great things that we're telling you, you may still be stuck and then you have to go next level. Yeah. All right, so after we turn the car on, dog's okay, we're cool, we've done it a few times. Now go for a short drive. <laughs> like, so the reason why you're saying a short drive is, um, and also, how long you might have to go on these short drives will depend on your dog and depend on how quickly your dog realizes that the car is not delivering her to a place of terror, right? So again, this goes back to, you're not always going to the vet. You're not always going to a nail appointment or a grooming appointment, right? You're not always driving on the highway where those weird highway strips like make a weird noise and rumble the whole car. So you want to do short sessions where I literally, I'll have um, a cup of treats in the car, in my whatever cup holder, and I'll just be tossing treats to the dog the whole time we're driving around the block just to create that positive appetite response. You get these awesome treats. No big deal. We're not going to die. We're just going around the block. Then we're coming back to the house. And some dogs don't want to eat because they're stressed and that's fine too. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they want to chew on a bully stick or something like that. But the short drive is key. I grew up with a great Pyrenees and I'm telling you that dog they would load her in the car and drive down the shore a couple times in the summer and she would shake and pant. We had the windows open. Her fur would be everywhere because she would <laughs> rest shed. It was a nightmare for everybody. When you got in the back to get her out, the blanket was yeah. soaked. That poor creature. Yeah. She would have been a dog that would never have desensitized. She would have been a dog who would have benefited from some sort of medication. Just like go to sleep and yep. wake up when we get there. Yeah. And maybe we're talking about dogs now who just have maybe annoying habits in the car. So from experience, uh, my foster dog, when he gets in the car, he just barks. He screams, barks his little head off the entire time. And this was a good example of what Kathy was saying, where I didn't have time to desensitize and counter condition him. I, he had to go to the vet. We had to go out for training sessions. We were working on a lot of different behavioral stuff with him. So what I wound up doing is he was crate trained, right? So he would go in the crate and I would cover it. And that like that fix it. He's no longer practicing the rehearsal of behavior. If I need to, I can slowly work on, maybe I just open one side of the crate with the sheet so that he can look out one window. We just drive around the block. If he can be quiet, I can reward him for that. But doing things like creating them and putting the sheet over it can help deter a lot of those behaviors. The dogs who uh, whip their head or they go barking, they slam into the window and start barking their heads off, right? I had a client's dog who he slammed his head down on an open window and shattered it, right? He was okay, but safety is really important, especially if you're driving. It's not safe to have a dog losing their mind in the back seat while you're trying to safely drive. So something as simple, create your dog, put a sheet on it. There's no visual stimulation anymore. Um, That can be really helpful to help break through some of these behaviors, or at least don't let your dog practice them because Rex is just having fun. There is no reason for him to be barking out the window like a lunatic, right? No reason. There's no, there's no bikes going by. There's no cars going by. There's nothing. He literally, the former family, he was able to practice this behavior over and over and over again. And they used to just drug him. And I wasn't willing to do that if, again, I had this other option where I could put him in the crate and cover it. So that can be one, like, don't underestimate how awesome of a resource that can be to help you guys work through this car phobia stuff. Yeah, I had a dog like that. My border collie quick. He would look at things. There's a car. There's a car. Yeah. There's a car. And then he would just make himself throw up. I've also yeah. had students. Motion oh, sickness. Yeah, right. Or how about the client who doesn't know their dog is a problem yet because they haven't turned on the wipers. Oh, and everything is going great. Right. <laughs> and all of a sudden it goes whoop and they have a dog in their lap, losing their mind, trying to get. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. It, 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 it's happened. So basically, you know, everything like Sarah and I always talk about, we can ruin anything, even car rides for you. Uh, everything is a potential hazard. <laughs> we want you to know that. <laughs> um, additionally, Sarah, let's talk about the dog who just needs a break from the car, right? Yep. Get a vet who will make a house call. Get a groomer who will come to the house. Mm-hmm. Bathe your own dog. Do some training online in your house. Like just... Give the dog a break from it. 
Yep. And then maybe go back and start incrementally building up to that. We're exactly. serious when we say get a different vehicle. I've seen that. <laughs> I, I've seen that happen with people who have a dog. The friends come over and that dog jumps in their car. They're like, yeah. seriously, it's taken me a year and a half. My dog won't go near my car. So yep. these are the things you can do. And then at the end of the day, if it's a really big problem, you just have to modify your life a bit before yeah. you've solved this. All right, guys, as always, if you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you'd like, rate, subscribe, tell a friend and share this episode with people who need to hear it. And also a lot of times people don't realize that these are also on YouTube. So if you prefer kind of watching us interact and stuff like that, you can always watch these episodes on YouTube too. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye guys.